Hello, John Perry here. I teach biology for a living. I do stuff in classrooms and I work for different uh, genetic research companies, but mainly what I do is I make animations for teachers to use in their classrooms. So I mostly teach biology on the internet. And one of the weird things that happens to you when you teach biology on the internet is that your email inbox fills up with hate mail from young earth creationists. Now let me just stop here and point out that there is a difference between a creationist and a young earth creationist. Uh, anyone, I suppose, who believes in a creator god, so Muslim, Jew, etc., they would be creationists. They believe in a creator god. But a young earth creationist is someone who is anti-evolution. They believe that the science of biology, particularly evolutionary biology, has to be attacked. It has to be rejected at all costs. And this does not represent all Christians or all Muslims. There are, are there is a large and growing number of Christians and Muslims and Jews, etc., who are perfectly fine with the science of evolution. So it's just a this is a small subset of Christians, but it's a very loud subset. And not only do I get emails, sometimes people will make videos about me. And recently these two guys, one calls himself Matt Man, which is that's a pretty cool username, actually. That's you know, Matt is his name. And then, you know, Batman. So it's, yeah, that's cool. And then the other guy, his name is, he calls himself Standing for Truth. And these guys made a two hour and 20 minute rant about one of my videos about endogenous retroviruses. And we'll talk about what endogenous retroviruses are in a little bit. But the important thing to know is that what scientists have discovered is that there are stretches of DNA in the human genome, and actually in most animals, that actually came originally from viruses. They were inserted there by viruses. And it just so happens that if this is true, uh, it means that the creation model is false. And the reason for that is that humans and chimps share the exact same insertions in the exact same locations in our genomes. And that tells us that these viral infections, the ones that we share between humans and chimps, those occurred before the human and chimp split. It, it demonstrates that humans and chimps are related. Now, of course, <laughs> we already know that from a whole bunch of other lines of evidence. But, you know, this, this particular line of evidence that humans and chimps are related for whatever reason, it really rubs these two guys wrong. So, Matt Man and Standing for Truth, they made a two hour and 20 minute video ranting about the animation that I made that explains how endogenous retroviruses work. We're gonna look at that video here. We're going to look at two parts of that video in particular where they asked a direct question to me. So I will answer the question that they asked. Today, I will answer Matt Man's question in a future video, I will answer the question that comes from Standing for Truth. So stay tuned. This video is going to be juicy. 113 questions about evolution with John Perry. Evolutionary question number 26. Endogenous retroviruses, why do they sometimes help their hosts fight active viruses? Okay, so here in a moment... We're going to look at the creationist video. We're going to hear from Matt Mann. Before we do that, I want to do a quick refresher on what endogenous retroviruses are. Endogenous retroviruses are stretches of DNA that got into our genomes because our ancestors were infected by retroviruses. A retrovirus is a virus with a RNA genome, and it converts that RNA into DNA, and then it inserts that DNA. It inserts its genes directly into the host cell's DNA. And it does this seamlessly. The host cell thinks that the, uh, you know, the virus genes are its own genes and it makes copies of the virus. Well, if this process happens to happen in a sperm cell or an egg cell or a recently fertilized zygote, and then that zygote starts developing into an organism, every single cell of that organism's body will have a copy of the virus in it. And this, of course, can be detrimental. It can kill that organism. It's got viruses all throughout its body. But if these stars are just so aligned, right, if, if there's a little bit of luck, 
a mutation can disable that virus before it's able to cause much harm. So if really early on in development, there's a point mutation that breaks one of its genes that's really important for the virus to survive and, and reproduce, that virus can't do its virusy functions. Some of its other genes might still end up producing protein products, active protein products, but the virus won't be able to make that animal sick. And when this happens, natural selection doesn't weed out this infected individual. That infected individual can live and can actually be a successful individual and can reproduce and then pass those viruses on to its offspring as well. It's endogenous retroviruses, endogenous because it is inside from the beginning. So here is Matman. Do you literally believe, I want an answer to this, do you think that a virus hit your ancestor, went dead, be, later gained a function to kill viruses that attack your body? Think about that. Because that is actually what some ERVs do. They kill viruses. So if you're telling me that a dead virus became active and created something to do to kill its own kind, is what would your, be your rationale to that? What, what is the logic behind something that would kill its own kind? So before I answer that, just to give a little bit more context, because again, he went on for two hours. So his argument is that endogenous retroviruses can't have possibly come from viruses. They must have been created by God and, and God just made them to somehow look exactly identical to viruses. They must have been created at the moment of creation. And we just got confused and think that they're viruses because, of course, a virus would never, never hurt a member of its own kind. My goodness. Well, <laughs> why would a virus get inside of a human and then turn around and immediately start attacking members of its own kind? Why on earth would a species attack members of its own kind at all? Apparently, Matt Man has not heard of, oh, I don't know, World War II. <laughs> Or maybe he doesn't know that mountain goats fight each other for mates, or that plants compete for parts of the forest with extra sunlight. Competition within a species, it happens everywhere. We would expect that it would happen in viruses as well. And it just so happens that back in the 80s, way back in the 80s, we learned exactly how it is that viruses fight each other. So when a virus gets into a cell, oftentimes it will then immediately start preventing other viruses from getting inside that cell as well. Just to show you how they work, this is a human cell on the left and it's being infected with a virus. This is only one of several different ways that a virus can get inside of a cell. They can also just fuse with the cell membrane itself and spill their guts in. What I'm showing here is called endocytosis. So the virus comes and it attaches with its little spike proteins to receptors that are on the outside of the human cell. And those receptors, they have specific purposes. The cell is using them for something. There's lots of different types of receptors that human cells have. And the virus has just evolved a spike protein that fits sort of like Velcro and attaches to those. And then the cell will swallow the virus. It'll think that it's something worth swallowing. It'll swallow it and then the virus can release its genome and wreak havoc inside the host cell. So it's a nasty little trick that these viruses have evolved. But back in the 80s, this is 1989, so maybe maybe we should say this is the 90s. Be a little bit more nice to uh, Matt Man. We've known about this since the 90s. We learned that virus envelope genes, so this is these are active viruses, not endogenous retroviruses, but just normal viruses. They're envelope proteins, they're envelope glycoproteins. They can act in a way that prevents the super infection of a cell. So this is the key word that you need to look up if you want to look into details about this in the scientific literature. Super infection interference, or also it's called super infection exclusion. These are the two terms that are commonly used. The word super infection frustratingly actually has two definitions that are used in virology. You can say that a cell is super infected if it's been infected multiple times by the same virus. You can say that a human is super infected if they've been infected multiple times by different strains of the same type of virus. So we've got, you know, COVID going around right now. There's multiple strains of it. 
you could get one strain of it and you can develop a little bit of immunity from that, but you can then get hit with a second strain and get infected with that as well. But when we're talking about these restriction enzymes and the research that I'm looking at right here, super infection means that a single cell gets infected multiple times by the same virus or by a virus that's really close to the same virus. Most viruses have evolved ways to stop that from happening. And the reason for that is that, you know, natural selection, those which happen to be better at reproducing, tend to reproduce better. And that's it. One of the things that can make a virus better at reproducing is, you know, having a mutation that allows it to stop other viruses from getting inside the cell that it has already entered and using up the resources of that cell as well. Because every cell only has so many resources and every virus is trying to get the most out of those resources as possible. And so you can think of this sort of as an evolved way to fight for one's territory, you know, to, uh, yeah, it's, it's like planting a flag on the moon, right? This, this belongs to us now. We see this in many different animals, different plants, all sorts of organisms do this sort of thing. They defend their territory against invaders. This is super common. It evolves all the time. Of course, something like this has evolved in viruses. And here is the proof of this. In this case, these glycoproteins, what these glycoproteins do, the spike protein, which is actually made of, let me pause this animation so you can see better what's happening here. So the spike protein on the outside of a virus, usually it's actually a group of proteins that are stuck together. And here what I've drawn is that one of the proteins in that complex has been produced by a virus that already got inside of the cell and is being excreted and it it binds competitively with those receptors so that the actual virus can't get in. This is one of many different ways that vi different viruses have evolved to stop other viruses from getting inside of a cell that they are already inside of, they're already infecting. And it, it's, it's a really good way to stop other invasions from happening. This has been extremely well studied. There are papers you know, spanning many years of research on this. We understand how it works really well in a lot of different species. And actually this one right here, virus wars, using one virus to block the spread of another. This is a new attempt to exploit this behavior to actually treat viral infections. This is really cool. This has only been done in bacteria so far. We're using a virus that's benign to bacteria. It does infect them, but it's fairly benign, doesn't hurt them very bad. And they've engineered that to block the infection of other viruses that are really deadly to those bacteria. And the idea here is that we could eventually develop a method to treat things like HIV in this similar way. You could actually rid a human's body of HIV by using other viruses that can get into cells that have HIV and then interfering with the replication. That would be really cool. You could actually rid someone's body of it, but this is still in development. So Matt Man, to answer your question, do I really believe that a virus would get into a body, a human body, and then betray its own kind and start attacking viruses? Yes, viruses do this out of the box. You don't need any mutation. They do this naturally. It is a well-studied, well-understood phenomena. Please look it up. I've shown you a few of the papers, and there's a lot more in the scientific literature if you just look up those keywords. So super infection exclusion is the keyword that you want to look up. Now, you also said uh, this. What was it? He showed the little things and then he said, um, uh, yes, they accumulate deleterious mutations, but sometimes viruses can be beneficial. What? He means, he means, he must mean over time, after they've been deactivated, they can become functional. That's what they believe anyway. No one's ever seen somebody bombarded by a virus or a viral load and been like, oh, awesome. I got a tan. You know, it's great. It's going to help me in the sun. It actually is true to my knowledge. No one has ever gotten a virus that gave them a suntan. <laughs> but a very similar thing has happened to a mouse population. So scientists like to breed mice for scientific research, and they watch very carefully if anything weird happens. And one of the mouse strains that was being worked with suddenly gained a new 
fur color. It gained this really beautiful sort of like a silvery sand color. They used to be brown, and then they turned into this really nice silvery sand color. Here's a paper about it in Nature, which you can go ahead and read. It's really, the significant thing about this is that new ERV sequences, so when an endogenous retrovirus inserts itself into a host, not only can it help them fight viruses, it can actually give all sorts of weird benefits. It, it causes things to change. They can get in front of a certain gene and change that gene's expression. There's all sorts of things that can happen when a virus gets into a genome. Of course, they can do bad things as well. They can screw up things and, and cause harm. But in this case, the insertion of a viral genome into every single one of the cells of this mouse, it actually just changed its fur color. Here, I'm showing you the before and after effects of this virus, which is really interesting. It's almost a kind of a metallic-y look. It's really pretty. So now obviously the question might be, well, what does that do for the mouse? How could that possibly help a mouse? Well, we know from studying mice in the wild that uh, fur color changes can actually help them exploit new in ecosystems, new environments. So there's a there's been studies in, I can't remember what desert it was, but there's there's a population of black mice and they lived in these black rocks and they're kind of surrounded by sand and mutations that changed their co their fur color to a sandy color allowed them to go out into the sandy areas without getting attacked by hawks. So that was really beneficial for them. These viruses, they do all sorts of things to their hosts. They can do, depending on where they happen to land in the host genome. And according to the environment, those changes might be beneficial. They might be detrimental. It really just depends on circumstances. So there you have it, Matt Man. Hopefully you appreciated that little bit of education there. I will address the question that was made by uh, the guy that goes by Standing for Truth in the next video. So stay tuned, my friends. Stay tuned.